Hi, and welcome to A Sense of Wellness Podcast, inspiring and empowering a healthier you. I'm your host, Susan Greeley, and I'll be diving deeper into the four pillars of wellness, sleep, exercise, nutrition, and stress management. Today, I'm excited to talk about a nutrition and lifestyle topic that is both popular and pioneering when it comes to reversing chronic metabolic disease. Fasting is today's topic, and my guest is Dr. Mindy Peltz, who is on a massive mission to get the whole world metabolically healthy. Dr. Mindy is a best-selling author, keynote speaker, and nutrition functional expert. As a doctor of chiropractic, she has spent 25 years helping thousands of people successfully reclaim their health. Dr. Mindy is recognized as a leader in the alternative health field, and she really is a pioneer in the fasting movement. She teaches the principles of a fasting lifestyle, diet variation, detox, hormones, and much more. She has a popular YouTube channel, which has had more than 24 million lifetime views, and she is the host of one of the leading science podcasts, The Resetter Podcast. Mindy is also the author of four best-selling books, The Menopause Reset, The Reset Factor, The Reset Factor Kitchen. And what I'm most excited about is her newest release, Fast Like a Girl, a woman's guide to using the healing power of fasting to burn fat, boost energy, and balance hormones. We will be talking about that today. And I'm really excited and honored to have Dr. Mindy with me to share her passion for inspiring and empowering people to live healthier. Mindy, thank you for being with me today. Oh, thank you for having me. I'm excited for this conversation. It's great. It's so needed. I am with you on your mission, Mindy. There's so much work to do, as you and I both know, and many millions of people and women in particular need your help. Yeah, I I agree. I mean, we need to all band together is really my comment to that is that we the more voices that are really helping women metabolically, the more we can end chronic disease and so much suffering. So I love that. I love that you started with that. Yes. Well, that's what jumps out at me. I told you I found you through your YouTube channel, and it really is so helpful to you sift through all of the science. You digest that for everybody. And so many women are struggling. And of course, this doesn't just impact women. What's staggering is that statistic that I heard uh, read in your book, 12% of Americans, only 12% are metabolically fit. It's crazy. Yeah. Agreed. And I was thinking as you were talking, I'm curious how many of those 12% are men versus women. I mean, that's like a big statistic. But what we know is that women are more metabolically challenged than men. So I would wonder of like, if we look at the percentage that's not metabolically fit, I think we'd find there's more women there. I agree. There's a study right there to be done for sure. Yes. Exactly. We're talking to both men and women in this episode. I don't want to say it specifically to women. It impacts all of us, of course. And most men have women in their lives and probably need help understanding what many women are going through, particularly during this perimenopausal stage. I'll take a step back though. Mindy, I'd really love to hear your doctor of chiropractic for many years, so much experience overall in helping people get healthier. When did you head down this pioneering path, which it truly is as a fasting expert? Yeah, you know what's really interesting? So when I started my practice over 25 years ago, we had like, think of my practice was like a mixture of like a mini biohacking center mixed with a lot of body work. And people would come in with chronic conditions and we were able to get rid of them very, very quickly within month to three months. And so it kind of got to where you bring me anything, didn't matter if it was a thyroid problem or if it was a chronic pain issue or somebody struggling to lose weight. We were able to really implement everything from nutrition to detox to chiropractic to we didn't know about hyperbaric oxygen and things like that back then, but we brought in every tool we possibly can supplementation. And the first 10 years of my practice, everything was going very smoothly. We were healing people in a really unique way. But then something happened about 10 years in where all of a sudden we started to see that twofold. One was people were coming in with multiple symptoms. Nobody came in with one symptom anymore. And the second was that people were not adapting as quickly or responding as quickly to the tools that we were giving them. And so when I dove into that and started looking around to see like what exactly was the cause of that, you started to see that there was a real influx in toxicity into our food system. Glyphosate being one of the biggest it is sprayed on everything. It's in, it's in the atmosphere. We started to see a lot of leaky gut issues. 
Then when we started to see all the toxicity that was the FDA allowed into our food, we started to see weight loss resistance. I then started to see women primarily coming in with like mood disorders, most common being that a woman would say, hey, you know, on paper, my life looks incredibly perfect, but I am so depressed. I am so anxious. And so I started to try to figure out why all of a sudden, like it was such a stark transition. And what I identified was this toxic piece. And so I actually stumbled onto fasting, looking for detox. And in that I came up, I found this term autophagy Mm -hmm. and autophagy is a way to stimulate the body to get rid of what no longer serves it to, to detox itself. So Mm -hmm. that was kind of my door in. And then when I realized it was fasting, my vision went, oh my gosh, fasting can be used by anybody. You don't need a lot of money. You don't need a lot of time. You just need to know how to do it. So that was really the door in. And then once I brought fasting to my patients and saw the results there, I took it to my YouTube channel and and then everything just exploded at that Um, point. I love that. I wouldn't have known that, of course. So let's start with defining autophagy for listeners. Mindy, I think that's really important. Can you describe what autophagy is and why it really is so important? Yeah. So autophagy, I think actually one step before autophagy that I'm sure you preach all the time is that the body heals itself. I just want to point this out again. We have had our power taken away from us because we walk into a doctor's office and the doctor does not tell you that you heal yourself. The doctor tells you, you say your symptoms, here's your fancy diagnosis, Here's your pill. Here's your surgery. All of that is pulling power away from us. And there is no education that the body can heal itself. So everything that I've ever done in my clinic and what I'm doing online now is teaching how the body heals itself. And when we look at autophagy, it is the most brilliant mechanism that what happens is in the absence of food, the cells turn within and they go, okay, guess what? There's some parts in the cell. They don't, it doesn't work really well. There's some bacteria and some viruses. This cell might turn into a cancer cell. This is an aging cell and it repairs it on its own. And the, uh, the main way that you can tap into that is through fasting. So when I understood autophagy, which I didn't really gather till about 10 years ago, once I understood that it was like, oh my gosh, if we can, look at this toxic environment that is continually growing in our world. And we could teach people how to detox themselves without spending a dime. Now we have a a door in to ending chronic disease. Yay. Right? (laughs) Oh, absolutely. It's so true. And I think you were ahead of the game. I think you came to it earlier than, than many of us. It was probably five, six years ago when I first heard of autophagy and through these fasting longevity diet and fasting mimicking diet. And as with you, I love to teach people about this and educate them. And what is autophagy? How does it help clean ourselves, help the body repair itself? Food heals. You preach this. All that healing power is within the food we eat, the lifestyle we teaching people those tools and techniques is what you do so well. And you really do, Mindy, and I'm thrilled to be talking about it. And I hope that so many listeners actually come away from this conversation today, knowing what they can do, that it is within their power to implement, even if it's a daily fast, but we'll talk about that because I know there is no one size fits all with fasting. I used to have questions with for you. That's great. Yeah. So even with dis- describing that autophagy and how to get there, why it's important, detox the body, support the body's own regenerative, restorative and healing powers it takes me to your book. So I really want to talk about how to fast like a girl. I love the title. I listened to a lot of your, the YouTube episodes on your channel about how and why you even chose that title. And I absolutely love it even more hearing, hearing that story. So I would encourage Thank you. A question came up for you though. What was your favorite chapter? And you said it was chapter two, the healing power of fasting. And you synthesize all the science in this. And this is what's so important because it is overwhelming. People go out there all the time, right, Mindy? Yep. And they find so much information. So how do you know where to begin? Well, yeah. it's such a good question. And that chapter, I actually rewrote five times. That's It was like the most time consuming, but it was because I really wanted people, I wanted to take everything that I knew about fasting and really synthesize it with the right science, explain why you would do each level of fast 
so that people could just read that chapter and have a very clear idea. So the thing that we know is that we've got about six different length fasts that have science attached to them that show that the longer we are in a fasted state, the more healing happens. And so I look at these as like ledges. There's 13 to 15 hours. We call intermittent fasting. I call it an autophagy fasting starts around 17 hours. The gut repair happens at 24 hours. You burn more fat at 36 hours, 48 hours, you reboot your dopamine system. And at 72, you reboot your immune system. So if you go into a 72 hour fast, you get all of that. So when we look at building a fasting, what I call a fasting lifestyle, we've got to ask ourselves, which one of those tools do we want to pull out? And the best analogy I can think of is it's very much like a Swiss army knife. If you carry one around, it's got a lot of uses. And so you might pull out the tweezers, you might pull out the big knife, you might pull out the corkscrew, but the knife itself is very, very useful. But what you use within the knife really depends on your intention. And that's what I feel like with fasting is that as the fasting movement has grown, we have to stop and ask ourselves what length fast is best for me and not get caught into what we do with any diet or health trend is try to make it a trend for everybody. What I'm trying to do with fasting is help people find the right trend for them. Such an important point, Mindy. And I love your Swiss army knife analogy. It's the best. Yeah, thank you. (laughs) No, it's really helpful because people get confused and it is so important to have that personalized approach to the fasting. There is some form of fasting that I believe, and I assume you do too, is beneficial for like everybody can fast in some certain way. So how do you decipher, how do you discern what is best for you? And so on that, I I just want to make one point. And this is because if you're new to fasting, a lot of people look at fasting as a fad diet. It's not a fad diet. It is a healing state. You put your body into it and you can attach any diet you want to your fasting lifestyle. The second thing that I want people to understand is that it's like sleeping. We know that sleeping is a healing state and everybody should be sleeping and definitely prioritize sleeping. But it doesn't mean everybody knows how to get a good night's sleep. So fasting is the same way. It's like it is a healing state you're going to put yourself into, but it may be There may be some bumps to get yourself into that healing state. So this is why I'm trying to to change that and show people the art of doing fasting because that way we all can use it as this healing tool and it's free. It is free. That I loved hearing that. And to what degree do you need the healing? Right. right? So people who are physically ill and some are just trying to prevent it. Exactly. And I think that that's the point I want to make too. There's something in there for everybody depending on where you are. And you yes. may be very healthy, right? It's still for you in some way, shape, or, or form. Yes. Um, and, you know, taking this to women and this issue of all the obesity we have in this country, overweight and obesity, Mindy, let's, let's focus specifically on weight loss because it plagues so many women in particular, men and women, but this whole perimenopausal and menopausal weight gain, it's a real struggle. And So what are uh, three things that can help people burn belly fat and what in your, you know, in all of your experience is the key to weight loss? Yeah. But so here's another thing is that once I, I dove into fasting and really understood what was going on, I realized that there were two energy systems that our body operates from. And another word for energy system is metabolism. So you, so when we walk around and go, oh, I have a slow metabolism, my metabolism's not working for me. I want you to remember that we don't have one metabolism. We have two metabolisms. And one is that you, your metabolism will do something in particular when you eat food. And one, your metabolism will activate when you don't eat food. So I call it the sugar burner system and the fat burner system. So when all we're doing is manipulating our food, depending on like your nutrition program or your, maybe you go on some fancy new diet, all you've done is manipulated the sugar burner system. Your blood sugar goes up, then it goes down, blood sugar goes up, then it goes down. This idea that I eat six meals a day is going to speed that system up is completely erroneous. There is no research on that. The idea that breakfast is the most important meal of the day was a slogan that came up, a cereal company came up with in the 70s. Also, nothing that shows us scientifically that those two statements are accurate. So what you've got to do if you want to lose weight permanently 
is you've got to learn how to switch over into the fat burning energy system. And the way you do that is through fasting. So about eight hours after you eat, your body's going to make that switch. Blood sugar is going to come down. It starts to switch over into fat burning. About 12 hours of not eating, you're in the fat burning system. Takes about four hours to switch over. And now you're making something called a ketone. And a ketone can only be made when the body burns fat for energy. So the ketogenic diet got like a bad rap, but really a ketone is just a sign that the body is now in this new system and it is burning energy. And then you want to switch back to your sugar burner. So you go in and out of these two systems, which I wrote about in one of my favorite chapters as well as metabolic switching, the key to losing weight. We have not been taught how to switch in and out. And so therefore, every discussion we're having around weight loss is around the sugar burner system and we've completely left out the fat burning system. And that's why we just keep popping from diet to diet to diet because we're not using both of those systems. It's so helpful putting it in those terms. It really is. It's fun to talk about. I had never even thought about it myself. And the crazy thing is, Mindy, all of those ideas that we've all heard, even as a nutrition professional, I deal with this every single day. Isn't, shouldn't I eat breakfast? Like what is the most important meal of the day, but also the six to seven to eight meals. I just had somebody eating six times a day and yeah. her nutritionist, her dietitian had told her, filled out this, wrote out this meal plan for her that included I'm laughing, right? The right. No, it's, it's three meals and three crazy. snacks. She's a petite yeah. woman and she's gaining weight. And I said, the best way, so I have my little tagline, to gain weight is to eat too much too frequently and too late yes. at night, right? Yeah, perfect. Yeah, because you never, so let's go back to this idea. You never leave the sugar burner system. So all you're trying to do is create a change within one metabolism. And that metabolism doesn't even burn fat for energy. It only burns it from your food. So you eat at eight in the morning, blood sugar goes up, then the blood sugar goes down. Now, instead of switching over into the fat burning system, which your body innately would want to do, you eat again. Blood sugar goes up and it comes down. So you, you're literally, it's crazy making, which is why we have the obesity problem that we have, why we have the metabolic mess we have, because nobody's taught the world how to switch over into this fat burning system. And how do you help somebody start to go from that place of eating too frequently they're really hungry, Mindy, and I encounter yes, this every day too. So where do you start where they say, I really can't go four hours without eating? Yeah. So there's three major food changes. I'm sure you teach this, but the three major food changes I tell people to make is to swap out your oils because we know oils like cottonseed and corn and, and canola oil, all of those are going to make you insulin resistant. So you got to know your difference between good and bad oils. Make sure you're doing good and avoiding the, the bad. The second thing is the ketogenic diet got a, a lot of bad rap because everybody was going so low carb. And I'm actually a fan of medium carb and to switch to nature's carbs, get off the cakes, the cookies, the pastas, the breads, not a lot there for you. Lean more into the fruits, the vegetables, the root vegetables, your potatoes, eat things that come from the earth. And then the third food change is stop eating toxins. Get off your diet Cokes. Get off of the chemicals that are in your food. Well, all three of those food changes are making you gain weight and putting you in weight loss resistance. Once mm -hmm. you've done that, switching into this fat burning system is going to be so much easier. And what I say to people is start by pushing your breakfast back an hour. It'll be tough. I'm not going to tell you that hour you may want to kill somebody and you might be a little hangry, but here's the thing is you're training your body. If I was going to run a marathon, I wouldn't try to all of a sudden take on 13 miles right off the bat. I might go, gosh, I haven't run in a while. I'll try a mile today and then I'll try it two miles in a couple of days. So we know from an exercise standpoint that that makes sense. But as we learn to switch into the fat burning, just keep pushing your breakfast back an hour and then do that for a couple of days. And then push your breakfast back another hour. And if you do that and pair it with those three food changes, you'll be gold. You will absolutely start to learn that the longer you go without food, you're not hungry, you burn more fat, you have better energy, everything that all of us have discovered. Mm -hmm. Switching over and really focusing on the quality of calories too, as you just mentioned. Yes. Yeah. You can't do one without the other. 
Yeah. Like yeah. you can, and, and I think this is a trap that many people do fall into. They think, oh, I fasted. So therefore at the, the one meal I eat in a day, I can gorge myself on any calories, not the case. And right. we yeah. really have to reiterate that, right? So I'm with you removing the refined carbs, all those ultra processed oils, sugars, flours. I have my other tagline, Mindy, you need to focus on getting good fats, fiber, and phytonutrients. Perfect. Yeah, that's true. That's catchy. Yeah. It yeah catchy. I mean, it's, here's, the, here's the sad part of the food discussion is that the food industry has done a great job of keeping us addicted to food. And it, most of the food when you walk into your grocery store is toxic. I would say like, depending on what grocery store you go to, like 80% of it is toxic. So one of the best strategies, and I'm sure you preach this, is make sure you stay on the outside of the store. Make sure you're in the fresh food. But the minute we go into those middle aisles, you're going to have to start reading ingredients. And if you're picking food out and not reading ingredients, you are actually contributing to your own metabolic mess. So in our household, there's so much of what we eat is like meat, vegetables, fruit, root vegetables, potatoes, end of story. Like as many different ways as we can come up with that. And we avoid these prepackaged foods. That's excellent. It sounds like your whole family's on, I would assume that your whole family's on board with it. (laughs) It becomes hard on a daily basis. People want to know, and I will ask you in all that you're doing, because you and I were talking very busy working lives, families, balancing it all, juggling. How do you prioritize? Like, what does your day of food look like, Mindy? It's probably every day is different. Every day is different. Now I'm 53. I haven't had a cycle in six months. So I don't know if I'm going into more of a menopausal journey, which is a whole nother discussion. But I would say I definitely am not hungry in the morning. So I'll get up and I'll have, I've been lately um, having mushroom coffee. I've been experimenting with like what it's like to get off a coffee. So I'll have my mushroom coffee and then I'll usually break my fast somewhere around one or two. So I go about 15 to 17 hours. I usually break my fast with protein because as a menopausal woman, I'm fighting for muscle and protein helps build muscle. And then it's a lot of salads. It's a lot of uh, salads and meat. I'm a sweet potato, huge sweet potato fan. I'm a potato fan, squash fan. And then the fruit I do is typically berries. Like I'll do some berries throughout the day, but I really stick to meat, vegetables, fruit, and those starchier veg- root vegetables. That's pretty much what you'll see me eat most of the time. Plus, I do a lot of fermented foods. So I'll do a lot of sauerkraut. I'll do a lot of nuts and seeds that are raw. So I am always trying to think about my microbiome as well. Oh, I am too. It's funny. We could geek out on microbiome talk. Yes. <laughs> right. I agree. Uh, however, we also all travel and eat out and have these real lives. How do you handle that, Mindy? Well, this is where fasting shines because when you can't get to good food, you just fast a little longer. So here's a really cool study that I think everybody should know. Yeah, It was published in Cell Metabolism, which is a really well-respected research journal. And Mm -hmm. they found 16 hours of fasting, leaving eight hours of eating, helped you become metabolically immune from the damage of a Western standard of diet. So let me put this in in applicable terms. And I'm not saying eat whatever you want, but what this study proved is if you are eating McDonald's all day, if you're eating these highly ultra refined processed foods, but you're doing it in an eight hour window, leaving 16 hours for repair. Mm -hmm. That's what you're doing is you're leaving 16 hours without food so your body can repair then all of a sudden you now aren't going to see your inflammatory markers go up. You're not going to see your insulin and your glucose and your hemoglobin A1C go up. So because the body has time to repair itself. Now let's go to what most people are doing. They're having these ultra processed, ultra toxic oils and they're doing, they're like, oh, well, maybe I should eat a smaller amount. I won't eat as much of it, but I'm going to eat it six times a day so that I can speed up my metabolism. Right. I mean, not to throw a popular diet group under the bus, but some of the prepackaged foods that we see with the trendy diets that have companies that have been out there forever, they're Mm -hmm. packed with chemicals. They have you counting points. They have you looking at smaller portions, but that's not going to help you because what you need to do is give your body a rest from the toxicity so it can repair itself. And if not, it's like a, You know, have you ever been out in the ocean and on a big wave day and one wave hits you 
and you kind of get tossed and turned around a lot. And then a moment later, another wave comes, boom, hits you again. That's what's happening to your body if you're eating these harmful meals six to eight times a day, but you're trying to ration your size of, of portion. It's madness. It's, it's crazy making, which is why you can't lose weight. Mm -hmm. Quality of calories. I'll reiterate yeah. it. <laughs> yeah. It's a simple thing, but it's not so simple in, in people's daily lives somehow. Yes. Yeah. Getting off right. uh, of the rat race of, oh, I'm only eating my hundred calorie X, Y, Z, right? Right. Treat. Exactly. And just to reiterate that repair, rest, restore, that's the body. It heals. Yeah. It heals when you allow it to rest. And I want to bring up exercise too. When people are fasting, going so many hours without food, how do you work in and you're, you love to exercise or you know you need to exercise? How do you work that in, in a healthy way? Yeah. yeah. So it's, it's tricky. I personally like to work out in a fasted state. I feel lighter. I feel more energized when you get some ketones. It's like get, the ketones are like supercharge you. Mm -hmm. So I like working out in a fasted state. Other people, some people do better eating beforehand and then working out. So it's, you're going to have to make your own decision on that. But a really good hack that I've taught my community is that you go work out or fast and th like 13 to 17 hours, somewhere in that window, depending on where you're at, and then work out. And then when you're done working out, that first meal should be like almost immediately afterwards should be a protein. And the reason for that is when we go into a fasted state, the body is going to have to find where it stored sugar. And so it stores it in three areas. It stores it in your fat in your liver and in your muscle. So when your body is searching for sugar to dump and then you go and work out, now you have two reasons for the body to dump sugar. So it starts to pour that excess sugar out of fat cells, out of, of muscle cells, and then you come back in with protein right afterwards. And if you get 30 grams of protein, you trigger an amino acid receptor site in the muscle that tells the muscle to grow stronger. So the quality of protein, the type of protein really matters. But if you match that with working out in a fasted state, it's a game changer. You'll lean out, but you'll preserve muscle at the same time. Nice. And is that also for the, you know, I want to come back to women of that perimenopausal age who are trying to lose the belly fat. Does it help burn the belly fat? Does it yeah. Help? So so the belly fat's really interesting. And I just did a bunch of videos on this. And so there's a couple of things to know. Cortisol's in that belly fat. So, well, actually, let me back up one set. All fat is, is excess. So we look in the mirror, we villainize it. We're like, oh, I hate that. But I want to reframe that. I want you to look in the mirror and the places that you have extra fat, I want you to go, what have I done in excess? So I've stressed in excess. I've eaten in excess. I've overloaded my toxic load in excess. And so the brilliance of your body is it senses this excess and it has a decision to make. And what it will do is it decides, gosh, these are some, this, this is some harmful chemical. I don't want to put it in your internal organs. So let me put it on your belly. So that fat is actually there to save your life. And yet we look in the mirror, we villainize it. And we're like, oh my God, like no way that, and we just, we say all the shame and the guilt and all the stories in our head. So when you look at belly fat, I want you to see cortisol. And one of the first things I want you to realize is that stopping the stress, finding ways to handle the stress is going to be helpful. And when it comes to cortisol, anytime cortisol comes on the scene, cortisol is made to make you move. So if you're sitting at your desk and your boss comes in and says something to you and upsets you, the worst thing after your boss leaves that you can do is to stay sitting, sitting at that desk, walk around your floor, get out into the outside, but go for a walk. So you use the cortisol that got initiated from that stressful reaction. You don't actually hold on to it. Mm -hmm. So that would be the, the first thing I would say. The second thing we have to realize is that just because you make a hormone, doesn't mean you're able to break the hormone down. And there are two places that you break hormones down, the liver and the gut. So when we're dealing with body fat, we know it's this excess of cortisol. We also need to not only just manage our stress, but we need to support the liver and the gut so it can break cortisol down so it doesn't store that. This is where we can go into polyphenol, probiotic, prebiotic foods, 
That's going to feed your microbiome. And then I love a good bitter food, adding all the bitter foods in like radicchio, arugula, ginger, lemon, even coffee is a bitter food if it's clean, adding that stuff in to support the liver. So it really becomes a management of the organs that are having to deal with the excess stress. You see me smiling. Listeners can't see. I smile through everything you said there, Mindy. I love it. <laughs> I have a couple of comments. Not even, you know, back to, okay, reiterate, good fats, fiber, phytonutrients, yeah. right? To help, there you go. Okay. To help break down the cortisol. But back to what you said with, with the stressful moment in that all the more reason to, and you have to catch yourself if you're in a job, don't sit there and reach for the chocolate or the candy bowl that I have so many clients, right? Who are in the office and they do that. So just, you know, that awareness of that behavioral, like, oh, this is what I'm doing directly in response to that stressful moment. So that too. But then you said something very, very important that I don't want to overlook, which is how we see ourselves. And you look in that mirror and I was beaming when you said, how protective that belly fat is. Like people need to learn in some ways to reframe their own thoughts because those negative thoughts also impact that stress level, right? Yeah. So it's this whole, obviously vicious cycle in a way, but it can be positive or negative. And we can turn it around by looking, appreciating what that belly fat has possibly done to you by saving your life. Right. (laughs) Right. I mean, when have we thanked our fat? Like, never. never. So? We just get mad at it and then yeah. we shame ourselves. That has to stop. And then when we shame and guilt ourselves, cortisol goes back up. And now yes. that cortisol is going back on the belly. So we got to have a reframe for this. We've got to approach this differently, which is why something as simple as how, how you talk to yourself is going to have this massive impact on your diet results. And most people aren't realizing that. No, oh, I just love that. And I hope that resonates with listeners. Agreed. You know, that is free and so simple and positive self-talk. Yeah. Agreed. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. We could take it to some of those other lifestyle and, and coaching components, but they are just as important as the food you put in your mouth and the timing and the science and all of that. We need to know what we're doing and how, but we can't overlook all these other, the mind body connection really is it's all one. And right. I love talking about this. So yeah, agreed. Agreed. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for saying that. I think it's going to help a lot of people start to chip away at that belly fat because there is a lot to many women in particular have a lot of extra weight there. And I think this was just gave them a, the tools and a good starting point for reframing it. At least I really hope so. The other thing I would say is you, you mentioned the person who gets stressed out and they reach for food or so one thing we also have to remember is that food is a state changer. So in that moment when we are like, everything in my life is crashing down or today's a horrible day. And then we want to change that state. We reach for food, but there are other ways you can stay change that state. Walking is a great one because walking forward actually brings cortisol levels down and starts to rebalance your nervous system and that hormonal reaction to stress. Getting out in nature is a great one. So I've learned, my mom taught me to be an emotional eater. Not This was not any criticism of her, But Mm -hmm. as a young child, if you had a bad day, mom made you a meal and you sat down, you got mother's love and a great meal. And so fast forward, I learned bad days, good meals. And I started to use food to be able to soothe the bad days. Mm -hmm. And so what I had to realize is a catch myself when I was doing that and say, okay, no, wait, I'm not hungry. I just am upset and I want to not be upset. I want a good old dopamine hit right now. And so if you can acknowledge that, then you can turn it into a question where you ask yourself, actually, I just need to change my state. My emotional state right now is really disturbing me. So what resources do I have? And that's going back to how we started this conversation, which is, are you listening to music? Do you like to dance, dance in your living room? Do you have a great friend that you want to call? Do you want to get out? Like do something first before you reach for the food. And over time, you'll see that your reaction to using food emotionally changes. Completely. It really does. Step by step, those simple behaviors, but that awareness first, of course, you know, is the key. So that's really, really helpful, Mindy. I do want to ask you one more question about cortisol Mm -hmm. and stress hormones. You have so much information about hormones and cortisol in particular. We all think of it as harmful and evil as well. But is it something that people need to check 
Like, do you recommend that, say, the woman who's trying to lose that 15 pounds of menopause weight gain that and feels very stressed out and it's just in that whole vicious stress cycle? Should people yeah, be? So, yeah, the best thing, the best test, I'm sure you already know this. I love the Dutch test and it's a great hormone test. And the only reason I love it is because it does show you all the sex hormones. It shows you all of the cortisol patterns. So you're kind of getting, you pee, you know, four to five times in a, 12 hour period and you really get a good idea of what hormones are depleted, what hormones are amplified, and then you create a roadmap from there. So to answer your question, yes, but here's like some other things that we've seen on the Dutch test that's really interesting. Sometimes people will make cortisol, but they don't metabolize cortisol. Okay. That's the person that's going to have struggle to lose weight because every time there's a stress reaction, their body is making the cortisol, but their liver doesn't know how to break the cortisol down. So that is going to be more stored cortisol. So that's what a test like this can do is really help you get into the nuance. Instead of saying, stop stressing, it's more like, oh, we need more radicchio. Oh, we need to support the liver. Maybe you need to get off alcohol. Maybe there's a piece to that. So mm -hmm. it's really, there's more nuance to the cortisol conversation than just try to regulate it and make sure it's not too high. Right. And flipping that switch to how does one then, if they know that, have that information that they're not breaking it down, how do they switch it? But I, <laughs> I love that quote, you need more radicchio. Yeah. Yeah. And and it's, it's, the, the door in, like, I feel like I get, I get it. Like when somebody says, tells me to stop stressing, I just, I want to stress more. I want to kill them. Actually. I'm like, no, I'm trying to stop. Calm down. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> But I do think, especially you've mentioned a couple of times, perimenopause and menopausal women. And what we have to remember is that after 40, estrogen and progesterone are starting to decline. And cortisol, when cortisol spikes, it's going to make that decline even worse. So when estrogen goes down, you become more insulin resistant. So after 40, your stress toolbox, your mindfulness toolbox is not like a fun little thing you do to make sure you don't. You know, you're not angry at people over all day long. It is a life-saving tool. It is over 40 for women, especially. This is the time you really need to think about yoga. You need to think about the breath work. You need to start to play with meditation. You need to lean into more self-love and more self-care. These are not extravagant daily habits. These are necessities to make sure that you are able to balance those other hormones as well. Completely agree. And people talk about it now more and they don't feel quote unquote guilty. That's right. Yeah. It's crazy to think that people would feel guilty about engaging in some sort of creative work that they love. I have one client and she says that she loves to, she does different types of crafting and journaling. And I've gotten her to get back to both of them and Amazing. just right. And completely unrelated to her diet and exercise. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. That's incredible. It's fun to talk and see the change in people once they implement and really shift their whole concept of what is self-care and self-love and the approach to this, everything we're talking about. It isn't just diet and exercise, but I absolutely love this, Mindy. I really could talk forever about these things. I know that listeners love just kind of simple takeaways. You have so many tools. You really do. Tools and techniques. I encourage people to listen to your videos or better yet, check out your new book because it's fabulous. It really is. But I do want to ask you, what are some final, I'd say, quick takeaways for listeners to know about fasting as a way to improve their metabolic health? Yeah, I think, I think the first takeaway is to understand that wherever you are today, if you are not appreciating the body you're living in, you're really frustrated with it, to understand that it's part of the culture we've created and it is not your fault. Like in the fast, like a girl, I really emphasize that there's really five major failures that diets have set us up for. So relieve yourself. That's the first thing. It's like, it's not your fault. You've been head down a road. You've been taught to go down a road thinking that the pot of health gold was on the other side and it wasn't. So that's the first step. The second step is I really want people to understand that the body heals itself, that you are ridiculously capable. And this is part of my mission is taking women specifically that are feeling disempowered, educate them, show them how to do the health their way and turn them into an empowered woman. Because we're at a time in healthcare right now where we give our power away to our doctors, to the diet, to the supplement, to the medication. It's all about this exogenous 
outside in is going to save me. And the only person that's going to save you is you. So when you start to understand that you are your own hero, that your body heals itself, and you look for strategies like fasting to do that, you will get a new relationship with your body. You will, won't, you probably won't even recognize how your body performs, but you really will have this new relationship. And it's like, I'm trying to take the diet paradigm and just flip it upside down. But in that women especially have to like let go of the what you've been taught and start to step into a different way. Awesome. I'm right there with you. Thank you. With you. I love it. (laughs) Right. That's the whole purpose is to empower people to take control of their own lives and their own health. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. And it's so doable. Thank you, Mindy. That's probably the most helpful message. (laughs) Right. Because, because the the other thing I always tell my, my community is like, I can give you the tools. But if you don't have a paradigm, a new paradigm to put it in, then those tools are actually going to fail. So let's use fasting as an example. When you learn to fast, there's going to be some bumps along the road. It's not like it's all rainbows and unicorns. Like there's going to be a moment where you're hungry, you're agitated. You might get some reactions like a rash. You might find that you struggle to get back into food. There's an art to learning to fast. But in our culture, what we've been taught is if something's difficult along your health path, there must be a problem with it. So we we see this with like a fever. What do you go to the doctor? And if you have a kid with a fever, the first thing they're going to do is try to get you to bring the fever down. But the fever is burning out an infection. Do we want to bring it down? Is that always what we're trying to do? And it's uncomfortable. It's hard. But could we just see if the body, what it would, how it would heal if we allowed it to do its natural own healing processes. But we have villainized symptoms and we are not looking in general for the taking the responsibility over ourselves. But once you understand symptoms and once you start to take the responsibility over for yourself, every health goal you have ever tried to get will become effortless. I promise you, if you're listening to this and you're like, that doesn't make sense, try it try it and then come back to me and tell me it doesn't make sense. Of course it makes sense. You're inspiring me right now. I do this. I try to do this for people. Many, I just love hearing it. It's so true. Teaching people to be their own health hero, be their own hero, period. Amen to that. Yeah. And stop waiting. We villainized our doctors. One of my favorite books is by William Davis. It's called Undoctored. And it's how we now live in a time where you can go to the internet and you can learn how to take better care of your own condition than your doctor may know. So be a self-empowered person that understands how your body works and then get to know what health strategies work best for you. Amen. (laughs) Yeah. And help yourself heal. That's my father said I grew up with a very wise man and I he gave me all these dadisms growing up many, which led me on this path to helping others. But the one thing I heard since I was a small child is like, he considered me, even though I'm not a physician, but he would say to me, physician, heal thyself, like learn that. Yeah. And he saw that through food and what I do and is in the world of nutrition and that. And so it's the same type of mentality and really helping people embrace that. That's right. That's right. Great. So this is so fun talking to you because I love being inspired just as much as I enjoy inspiring and empowering others. And one thing that I do ask of all of my guests, Mindy, is what is one thing you are grateful for today? Oh my gosh. There's so many things. I don't even know. I have to say this. You're my only guest. I'm going to be, I'm stopping you before I even let you answer. This is what I love about listening to your videos and being honest here. I so appreciate and love how grateful you are to everybody out there. It is so sincere. It comes across. Mindy, every time you do a video, you thank everybody you're out there helping. Thank so you. I'm, yeah. So I anyway. I think I even realized I was doing that. Oh, you're so yeah. grateful all the time. Yeah. You see it. Yes. And it's a wonderful thing. So yeah. go ahead. And let, let you, you, know. you know what? I would say the first thing that I'm grateful for is how many people are waking up to conversations like we just had. I really think we're starting to see a real trend and especially, especially for women. And really, I'm, and that has provided a lot of opportunities for me to go out into the world and speak and people are wanting to hear. When we first went into the pandemic, I like, this sounds horrible. I'm probably the only person that ever did this, but I was a little giddy because I was like, Oh my God, everybody's going to be forced to take care of their health. Now we have put them in their homes. We have quarantined them. 
This is going to be the motivating factor that gets people to take action around nutrition and exercise and sleep and all of that. And then we sat there and nobody did anything and nobody stood up and taught people how to be healthy. And about six weeks in, I was in a total depression. Mm -hmm. I'm like, why aren't we teaching people metabolic health? It ties to the immune system. Now, fast forward three years. And what I'm seeing now is a trend of where people are saying, I never want to feel that disempowered again, because we saw how long it went on for. We all had so much fear. And now people are like, done, not going to do that again. And so those are the people that I've been out in the world giving tools to, I'm sure you as the same, and that I am truly grateful for. I am too. I'm right there with you. And they're listening now, just like you said. It really, really made a difference during when we were in the thick of it. Maybe not so much people went one way or the other, Mindy, and they either embraced it, got more active and took it to heart. Well, so many people started to eat more, drink more alcohol. Right. We all like, went the, yeah, the other way. Yeah. yeah. Really messed up their gut health and ended up depressed and, and full of anxiety. But then they course corrected many, many are just now, as you said, three years later, we're coming out of it and they're watching, they're observing, they're listening to conversations like this. And we're talking about some really basic steps you can take on a daily basis, right? Go out in nature, do some breathing, do some journaling, do some creative cooking and, and go dance in your kitchen or wherever it is. (laughs) Yeah. A thousand percent. I agree. Yeah. Yeah. But I'm really grateful to be talking with you about this. We're setting a new course for the future. Yeah, it's awesome. And I'm right there with you. Like I said, with you, supporting you, encouraging you, leading people to you. So Mindy, where and how can listeners find you? Yeah, I'm kind of everywhere, as you pointed out. So if you go to my website, drmindypelz.com, everything's there. I would say YouTube's really my passion project. So there, we have over a thousand videos on there on all aspects of what we're talking about today. My new book is out, Fast Like a Girl, which synthesizes all the like videos that I put uh, over there. I mean, I'm on Instagram, on Facebook. I have a membership group if people want more help. So you, if you go to my website, that's kind of my hub. Fabulous. And you make it fun. I do yeah, want to thank you. That. Oh, for sure. It has to be fun. It has to be it fun. Because the, the one hormone we didn't talk about is oxytocin and oxytocin balances all the other hormones out. So health has to be fun. Otherwise, it's just pain. I have to have you back. And we'll kick it off with oxytocin. And we'll end that today. I I do want to thank you again for your mission, your tenacity, your passion. You're amazing, Mindy. Thank you for being with me. Thank you. Appreciate you. Thank you for taking time to join me and listen to this episode. You can find more information and subscribe to the Sense of Wellness podcast on our website at ccphp.net forward slash sends. This show is brought to you by Castle Connolly Private Health Partners, a concierge medicine organization that partners with and supports exceptional physicians to deliver an unrivaled experience of comprehensive, collaborative, and attentive care for a preventative approach on health and optimal well-being for members. Be sure to listen in next time to the Sense of Wellness podcast. And remember, simple daily habits matter most.